Good morning, everybody. Um, please, everybody, take a seat. There's, of course, plenty in the front row. Um, I am a member of the class of 1987, very pleased to be here today. Uh, I sit on the board of the Dickey Center for International Understanding, which is a tremendous way to reconnect with the uh, college. When I was an undergraduate, I wasn't able to go abroad, and so it's been amazing as an alum, really trying to understand what is Dartmouth's role globally and what is the footprint that we're uh, leaving uh, in lots of different places. And one of the most exciting things I think that the center is doing is this, this work in the Arctic space. Also a really exciting project in global health, things in sustainability, and I would urge any of you who do not know about the Dickey Center to try to learn a little bit more. Um, also today, I'd really like to acknowledge the work of alumni relations uh, at Dartmouth. The lifelong learning team today has put on this program, as well as a series of programs over the course of the afternoon, and probably in your local communities, um, really saying how do we gather together the Dartmouth community to build um, uh, communities and clusters around ideas uh, in this uh, broader part of the Dartmouth family. Uh, but today, very excited to introduce our three panel members, um, Ross Virginia, Sherry Oberg, and Lauren Culler, to talk uh, today on Dartmouth, the polar regions, and the future. Uh, first, Professor Virginia is the Myers Family Professor of Environmental Science, Professor of Environmental Studies, and the Director of the Institute of Arctic Studies within the uh, John Sloan Dickey Center. He studies human influences on biochemical cycles in terrestrial systems and has participated in analysis of the critical issues facing the Arctic, its inhabitants, and nuclear cycling, nutrient cycling in the tundra ecosystems of western Greenland and the polar deserts of Antarctica. I aspire by the end of the talk to understand what that means. Um, <laughs> In his role as co-director of the University of the Arctic Institute of Arctic Policy and in conjunction with Dartmouth College, Professor Virginia has established an exchange program for Greenlandic students and secured grants to design a program of collaboration between scientists and engineers around polar environmental change and incorporating um, fieldwork policy studies in Greenland. Um, in Antarctica, for those of you collecting important trivia, a portion of the McMurdo Dry Valleys has been renamed Virginia Valley, honoring his lifelong efforts in conducting. <laughs> Long-term ecological research. And in, in October 2014, Professor Virginia was selected by the US State Department as one of two distinguished lead scholars of the newly established Fulbright Arctic Initiative. Sherry Oberg is a member of the class of 1982. Um, as well as Tuck 1986. She's an entrepreneur with more than 25 years experience running private and public NASDAQ listed companies. Currently, she's working with Langer Labs at MIT in a program funded by Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation developing a technology to eradicate malnutrition in the developing world. Previously, she was president and CEO of Accusphere, which she co-founded in the basement of her house and grew into a specialty pharmaceutical company with over 100 employees and a broad technology that generated four drug candidates that entered human clinical trials and now lives nearby. Um, she's, been aboard, she's been an active member of various professional uh, societies, uh, including service on the boards of directors of um, Mass Biotechnology Council, as well as the Mass Medical Device Industry Council. Um, recently, she has just completed eight years of service on the um, Dartmouth Board of uh, Trustees, where she chaired the Audit Committee, uh, and 20 years on the Tuck Board of Overseers. Uh, she is a recipient of a long list of Dartmouth Awards, including the Young Alumni Distinguished Service Award, Tuck Overseers Medal. Uh, currently, she sits on the advisory board of the Tuck Center for Private Equity and Entrepreneurship and the President's Leadership Council. Married to a 78, she's also reuniting this year, um, and they have a daughter who is class of uh, 13, Tuck 18, and a son in the class of 16. Um, Lauren Culler is a lecturer in environmental studies and coordinates science outreach at the Institute of Arctic Studies within the Dickey Center. While earning her PhD in Dartmouth's Ecology and Evolutionary Biology program, 
she received a National Science Foundation Fellowship in Polar Environmental Change that spurred her interest in the polar regions. Dr. Culler has participated in 10 Arctic research expeditions to Greenland and Sweden and has led student educational expeditions to both Greenland and Antarctica. And I can say as part of my work with the Dickey Center, talking to the students who are on these programs, it is really life-changing and amazing. So I'm really grateful for that. Um, Dr. Culler holds a BS in biology and an MS in entomology from the University of Maryland and her research combines her interests in environmental change and entomology and has been featured in news outlets such as National Geographic, Newsweek, The Washington Post, and The Atlantic. Um, so please join me in giving a very warm welcome to our speaker. So I'm going to kick things off. First I'll tell you a little bit about what we're going to do today. Um, I'm I'm here because I had the pleasure of uh, going to the Arctic with Ross last summer. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, what I learned on that trip. Then we're going to show you a video um, so you can actually see what we saw um, there. And then um, Ross and Lauren are going to make some opening remarks. We're going to do a little Q&A amongst ourselves and then I'm going to open it up to the audience to ask whatever questions you have on your mind. Um, so as I said, I had the pleasure of going with Ross to the Arctic on a Dartmouth trip that, um, that Ross led. President Hanlon and his wife Gail were there. We had about 40 Dartmouth alums that were with us. We traveled with experts, not only Ross, but also experts on, on whales and, and polar bears and uh, a leader of the indigenous people. I went on this trip. Uh, I really didn't know anything about the Arctic other than that there was a lot of ice that was melting fast and that it was a place where people were studying climate change. Um, so my remarks are for those of you in the audience that know a little bit about the Arctic, which has brought you here, but um, really don't know that much and are just curious about learning um, what's happening up there. Um, I was astounded by what I learned. It, it was full of drama and intrigue. I, um, you know, it's, I'm a history major, so uh, it's, it's not since the last ice age have we had ocean, an ocean open up. Um, so that was almost 12,000 years ago, and the Arctic Ocean was ice, and it's now turning into a, you know, a, a, an ocean as we traditionally think about it. Um, that is having enormous implications, not just with climate change, which we're reading about in the paper on a regular basis here in the United States, um, but it's basically creating all kinds of new opportunities. Um, the Northwest Passage is opening up, the, North, the Northern Sea Route, which is along the Russian coast, is opening up, which is creating enormous commercial shipping opportunities, uh, the, the potential to compete with the Suez Canal and cut 28 days of shipping between the Atlantic and the Pacific Ocean has enormous com commercial implications. Um, huge, uh, uh, vast supplies of oil and natural gas are becoming newly accessible. So literally trillions of dollars worth of natural gas and oil are becoming available. Again, huge commercial implications. And there's also um, earth minerals, rare earth minerals that are really important for uh, new technologies and cell phones and, and uh, national security that are only available up there. And as a result, we're having this international land grab that I think will go down in history as sort of the, the gold rush of our era. Um, it's, it's not just the countries that are bordering the, um, the Arctic, but even China is coming into uh, Russia, it coming into the Arctic. Russia and China are probably being the most aggressive. There's no real rules there as to who owns the Arctic and who has sovereign rights over these things. So Russia is being very aggressive and they went down onto the seafloor and literally planted their flag underneath the North Pole trying to claim um, that they own it. Canada feels like they own the Northwest Passage where I think most Americans think that's probably an international uh, pa uh, passage. So there's just this huge um, effort for everybody try jockeying for position. And um, so, so it opened my eyes to the fact that not only is this incredibly important area for climate change, this is a big geopolitical national security. The Russians are building huge uh, military capabilities along their coastline. They're doing all kinds of war games. Um, this is a very important area on a lot of different dimensions. Um, what I also learned 
is that Dartmouth has had a long, long history of leadership in, in the Arctic. Going back uh, to the early 1900s, uh, you know, there was a, 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 a somebody named uh, Stephenson who was one of the leaders in the Arctic. He was one of the explorers who was going in these very harsh conditions without the technology or um, special materials that we have to keep warm and was a leader in, in exploring the Arctic and would, was a sort of a national hero when, uh, this is in the days before television and the internet and he would fill stadiums when he would come back and talk about what he was doing in the Arctic. People were so curious to find out what he was doing. Well, John Sloan Dickey in the early 50s had the foresight to recruit Stephenson to come to Dartmouth to start up the Polar uh, uh, Institute in those days. And when he came, this was right around the time that the Cold War was going on. And, uh, and because half of the Arctic Circle's coastline is Russia, the Arctic Circle became a very important uh, geopolitical landscape during the Cold War. And Stephenson was such an expert that the U.S. government was trying to recruit him away from uh, Dartmouth to come and advise the U.S. government on Arctic issues that were necessary, that were important for the Cold War, and he wouldn't go. So that's when they came to Hanover and built the Cold Regions Research Lab, which I had driven by a gazillion times on Lime Road, had no idea what it was. Um, but that is, I think, a very tangible evidence that we're, it's not just us that thinks that we're experts in, in, in the Arctic. The U.S. government actually built a facility here. Um, and that tradition has been, you know, kept alive and you, you have the living and breathing example of that here with Ross, Virginia. Um, because once again, because of everything I said in my opening remarks, now that the Arctic has become, a, once again, a hugely important area, um, the, when the U.S. government, when the U.S. became the chairman of the Arctic Council, which is an international board that tries to resolve all these national security and environmental and scientific issues that are going around these uh, various governments, the U.S. became the chairman, and when we became the ch chairman of that, they picked Ross to be the co-lead of the, the scientific group that would be advising this very important group on all its policy matters. Um, so we have a long history of, of thought leadership in an area that has become increasingly important on a lot of different um, issues. It's, um, and it's a beautiful place and it was really fun. Um, we kayaked with whales, we were kayaking up against these icebergs that were literally the size of skyscrapers. Um, we had an opportunity to meet with the leader of the Inuit people who are the indigenous people here. So with that, I'm going to stop and just kick off the video so you can see what we saw and then um, we'll get into some Q&A afterwards.
so I think the picture tells a thousand words. We, ha we have obviously not only learned a lot, we had a lot of fun. And um, on this trip, we not only had um, intellectual and academic experts on um, the topics I talked about, but we had a photographer who, was t who took many of those pictures who was teaching us techniques for doing um, action photography and wildlife photography. We had an, uh, an Inuit artist who was creating art the whole time he was there um, and, and teaching us about how to do it. So it was a really fun trip and he's gonna, the alumni, fund, uh, the alumni office is gonna be doing another trip with Ross next year. So shameless plug, if any of you are interested in this, you, uh, you'll have an opportunity. But anyway, I'm sure this stimulated a lot of uh, old memories from you too, Ross. Yeah, well thank you, Sherry. And thank, thank all of you for being here. This is amazing turnout, it's fantastic. Yeah, that was a great trip, a wonderful journey, and I, you get an A for your introduction to the Arctic. For someone who <laughs> professed not to know much, you learned a lot on this trip and since then. Um, so I, just a little bit, I, I direct the Institute of Arctic Studies, and, and our, our, our mission really is to connect everything you saw up there with the students at Dartmouth. Um, we do that through the classroom, we do that through engaging students as, with our research in the field, we do that by providing fellowships so they can go off into these places to pursue an idea, an opportunity, take a class, whatever it is. And so um, um, when you look, you think about Dartmouth, you know, we are this, you know, the, the small college on the hill, but you've heard a little bit of the introduction that in the, in the world of Arctic studies, in the world of polar science, we are an internationally recognized center of expertise. And um, we have Corel here, we have the Institute of Arctic Studies, we have a almost a hundred year history of, of, of Dartmouth faculty doing really significant work and training a whole cohort of students that have gone off and done amazing things. Um, I spoke to the class of 1957 um, on Wednesday and they had an entire panel bringing back members of that class that had worked in the Arctic and the Antarctic. And, and these are some really prominent people that were, were stimulated by Dartmouth in that period when Stevenson was here and when John Sloan Dickey was internationalizing Dartmouth. So that, that's, I think, just a very, very special part of our history. And it's an area where Dartmouth, as I say, plays big. We're doing very significant work. And uh, for me as a professor, the best part is the students are just more and more engaged. They're more and more interested. They, they, they see the problems. They see climate change. They see the new ocean opening up. They, they realize that the livelihoods of indigenous peoples in the north are, are you know, are changing. Um, you, you saw the, the Inuit carver there, that, that's Greg, and um, let's see, it's tangled here, but this is the little polar bear that popped in there, this little carved bear. And um, um, I'm wearing it, and I'm wearing it because he presented it to me. And um, he's from a, a place called Hall Beach. Um, it's the longest continuously occupied community in the Arctic, several thousand years of, of continuous occupation and there's maybe 700 people there. And, and Greg has left that community to go to Iqaluit, the big, the big urban area in, in, in the Canadian Arctic, 6,000 people. Um, and and he's, he's there because it's hard for him to stay in Hall Beach. And if, if you ask you know, Greg what he does, it, you, know, you saw he does, he's an award-winning artist, but what, what he would say to you is, um, I'm a father and I'm a hunter, right? He's a hunter, that's his identity. And that's what's changing in the North, is this reshaping of the environment, but also the culture and people's identities. And those are exactly the kinds of problems and issues that you want to engage students in a liberal education about. So that's sort of, that's my passion. That's what I get to do. I thank all of you in Dartmouth for giving me the opportunity to travel the world with, with the students that are here and with graduate students and now professional colleagues like Lauren Culler. So let me, I'll stop there and let Lauren um, take it away. Yeah, thanks. Um, so yeah, I am a, I teach in the environmental studies program and I coordinate science outreach at the Institute of Arctic Studies. But I've been at Dartmouth since 2008 and that's when I came here to pursue graduate school in the ecology and evolutionary biology PhD program. That's when I met Dr. Virginia, and I had an interest in climate change and climate change ecology, environmental change, and he mentioned to me the Institute of Arctic Studies and that they were getting ready to launch this new polar environmental change graduate program. And 
I immediately wanted to sign up because it sounded amazing. So in my first year, I got a small grant from the Institute of Arctic Studies to go to Greenland for the first time. I had never worked in the Arctic before, and I got to spend, I think, about 10 days there with um, Professor Matt Ayers from the biology department. And we spent those 10 days in Kangalusuak, Greenland, which is where I've continued to go every summer for the past nine years. And we were uh, camping and looking for some field sites to do our science and had a lot of experiences on that trip that really hooked me on Arctic. And uh, I was hooked on the science. Uh, in the middle of the night, I woke up and I heard this really loud sort of thunderous sound and I, was confused. I thought, I don't think there are thunderstorms up here. Um, and it's sunny. What's going on? And um, the next day, we were out on a hike. And we came across this massive glacier. It's called Russell Glacier. It comes right off the Greenland ice sheet. And as we got closer, we realized that the loud thunder sounds we were hearing was actually calving from Russell Glacier, so large chunks of ice coming off and breaking up. And I think Professor Ayers and I just were silent for the next two hours sitting there just staring at this amazing landscape and seeing this change happen in front of our eyes that is sort of representative of what's going on across the Arctic, um, the loss of ice from glaciers and also from the sea ice. I think that same day we were driving back to town when we encountered a couple of hunters who um, were, they had just killed a caribou and they were um, looking to get a ride back into town. And this was a really interesting encounter for me too because it tied together sort of the science that I was interested in with then seeing the sort of social and the people side of things. And I think those two things are why I keep going back is because it's really interesting as a scientist to be thinking about the causes and consequences of the change that's going on and then also to think about the um, implications for um, northern societies. So as I mentioned, I've gone back, I just did my ninth trip to Greenland in May, and I'm going back in July to lead some students. Uh, and since graduating, I've had the opportunity to uh, work with a couple of programs where I've been able to go back to Greenland uh, with Dartmouth graduate students and also with uh, Dartmouth undergraduate students and also high school students. And I might have a chance to talk a little bit more about that later, but it's been a great way to kind of share my interests and kind of um, begin to train sort of the next generation of scientists. And Dartmouth's been a really great place to do that. So that actually tees up the question I was going to ask. I'm curious to learn more about what undergraduate students are doing and how they interact with the, the graduate students and how you, in a, how you collaborate with some of the other academic groups that are there and integrate with some of the policy that's going on. So when I was a graduate student, um, I, can, I can say a couple things about this. When I was a graduate student, I was in the IGERT program, um, the Integrative Graduate Education Research Traineeship in Polar Environmental Change that I mentioned. So one of the things was I got to go do a five-week field course with other graduate students from all around campus. Um, I was an ecologist, but I got to go with um, our scientists, so people studying the ice sheet, um, people studying um, geology, and I also got to go with engineering students who were looking at some of the uh, issues related to engineering and science in cold regions. Um, so that was a really great experience as a graduate student to be engaged in that interdisciplinary conversation around the Arctic. I also was able to often take undergraduate students with me to the field. So I had the opportunity to take a few with me um, and actually get them involved in the research that I was doing. Um, so that's one way. I don't know if, Rosh, you want to add to that? Yeah, well, I think, I think that I mentioned this whole engagement with undergraduates. And um, we have many different ways we can do that. Um, um, you know, I'm, I'm a field scientist. I have a lab group, and we have lab meetings. And, um, I don't know, we have what, between eight and ten people show up at our lab meetings. Everything from first year students to postdocs to Lauren, myself, and other faculty members engaged in this. And it's sort of a process. We have a lot of first year students that come in and say, you know, I think I'm interested in science or climate change, or maybe I'm interested in the Arctic. I've heard something about it. You know, how do I get involved? And we said, well, first thing, you know, let, let's see if we can find some funding for you. Um, there's a women in science program. There's uh, any number of opportunities for students to actually be directly supported to be part of a lab group. And they begin to work with, with the graduate students and myself and, and Lauren 
and they, they, they begin to show an interest, and then we can kind of move them into that, and they become part of this group, this very functional, interactive, socially, scientifically, and very productive group. Um, and, and that many of them, that's, once they start, it goes all the way through a senior thesis, and then we're, we're actively engaged as mentors in helping them move on to the next stage of their careers. And we have four students right now, part of our lab group in Greenland, two graduate students, two undergraduate students. They're, they'll be working a total of about three months there this summer. Um, the undergrads are, are helping the graduate students, but they also have their own independent research projects that they will execute during part of that time. So um, um, the engagement is very personal. Um, it, it's very intense. Um, it's intense for us as well. Um, um, and, and Lauren also mentioned the, the high school students. Uh, we have a grant from the National Science Foundation um, that brings together five U.S. high school students, five students selected out of 300 applicants nationwide. I mean, it's harder to get into this program than it is Dartmouth. Uh, that's what I tell these <laughs> students. Um, there, there are five students from Denmark and 10 students from Greenland. And we all live together, work together for three intensive weeks in Greenland. And if, if, if this isn't like an amazing example of science diplomacy, I can't think of another one. And the nature of that success in the last two cohorts of these five US students, we now have three students here at Dartmouth as, student, as, as undergraduates. Um, so uh, it, it shows me that we're doing something right, that we engage, that, that we, we're experts about the Arctic, but we're very passionate and welcoming. And I think the Dartmouth students uh, see that and have been drawn to the Institute and to, and to young faculty and scholars like Lauren. Uh, they, just, they just flock to what we do. So one of the things I remember when we went is um, there are a lot of people that are doing research up there and you knew all of them. You, you clearly had become buddies with a lot of them. You, so you've probably gotten some insight on how they approach their research and how our approach is maybe a little different. Could you talk a little bit about what our approach is and what makes it distinctive? Yeah, no, I'll, I'll, I'll let Lauren fill in around this too because she's very much part of that as the, the science outreach coordinator for the Institute of Arctic Studies. Um, the, the history of many Western scientists going to Greenland is they fly into Greenland, they go on the ice sheet, or they go straight to a research site, they do their work, and they go straight home. And they don't interact with anyone in Greenland. They, they know very little about Greenlandic society. They have few friendships in Greenland. Um, and um, that right off when we developed this IGERT program, that was one of the major goals was that if we're going to work in the Arctic, we need to be engaged with the people of the Arctic and we need to pick questions that are relevant to their needs. Um, and this is a, a really a, a shift in research in the Arctic and we call it co-production of knowledge or, or in, in that that there needs to be true partnerships in understanding the rapid changes in the Arctic. And so our students, when we come to our lab meetings, you know, we talk about science, but we also talk about politics. We talk about what's happening with Russia in the Arctic. We talk about the ways in which people who live in the Arctic, people like the Carver, like Greg, who's a hunter, um, how do they see change in the Arctic? You know, he's not out there with instruments and, and data books, but if, if you wanna know how the, the Canadian Arctic is changing, and you've had the opportunity to sit down and talk to Greg, right? And he can tell you, and he can tell you why it's important and, and what matters. And he can tell you the stories that go back generation to generation. And if you are able to use that to improve your own science, that's a very, very special thing. And most universities aren't quite there yet, but I think Dartmouth has really made a commitment to doing that. And um, um, and it makes it even more, it makes my, our science better and it makes our lives more fun in the Arctic. We have friends there now. Yeah, I think that's one of the benefits of the work we do where we are in Greenland for longer periods of time and we're living in a community where we come back you know, regularly enough and we start to get to know people there. Um, they're, one of the things I study in Greenland are mosquitoes, which are quite numerous and hated in the Arctic as they are everywhere else. And uh, we have pretty visible research. We always have all these tents and traps set up everywhere. And so um, we always are taking the time. People stop by all the time and want to know what we're doing. And, um, and so that has kind of helped us form these relationships that I think over time, uh, you know, we've, we've sort of built some trust in that community and an understanding of why we're there. And I think being in the IGERT program and now continuing to work with graduate students uh, and even with the high school students, we make a lot of effort to 
always stress the importance of um, outreach and communication about what you're doing. With the high school students, it's a really amazing chance for communication across three languages because we've got native English speakers, uh, native Danish speakers, and native uh, Greenlandic speakers. And so we actually, the students at the end of their expedition, they actually put on a couple of outreach events. One of them is at the international airport in Kangalusuak where there are hundreds of travelers coming from all around the world every day and they share with those travelers, uh, many of whom are Greenlanders, uh, sort of what we're doing there. And so, you know, we kind of make that effort that I don't think scientists have traditionally made uh, in Greenland or in many places in the Arctic, which um, I think has strained sort of the scientist community relationship in the past. So that's something that we try to do with every research project that we implement in the Arctic. It's interesting um, that the way you answer the question is because it's so core to our values as to respect for people in general and native peoples in particular and thinking about how the college got founded. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong in this because I'm doing this from memory of the trip, but as I recall, Stephenson, this guy who, was the, who, came, who came to Dartmouth in the 50s, um, he, he was known because when the Danes were taking over Greenland, they were kind of approaching it the Danish way and they couldn't survive the harsh weather and they were dying and ending up coming home without accomplishing what they wanted. And Stephenson made his impact because he integrated with the native people, developed relationships, adapted their customs, learned how to live in these harsh uh, environments. And that was part of his secret to success in, in, in learning his exploration. So this common theme of, of respect for the people that live in the area and using those relationships to do science is uh, kind of interesting 100 year plus uh, uh, theme here. Um, so Ross, you've been going to the Arctic for a long time. Um, you know, give us a sense of like what it was like there when you first started going and some of the changes that you've seen over time. Right, well, I've, I've been working since mid 80s, early 80s uh, in the Arctic. Um, and then I got involved in the Antarctic a few years after that. And for a good portion of my life, I was going back and forth every year. Um, and then I, I think, I just remember the day my wife just kind of like poked me and she said, just pick one, pick one. <laughs> um, and so, so actually for a while I shifted and, and worked more in the Antarctic. I've had 21 field seasons in, in, in the Antarctic and a, a good number, but somewhat less than that in, in the Arctic. But I, I've, in the last decade or so, I've migrated more and more into the Arctic because that's where the people are. That's where the issues that affect all of us are connected into the Arctic. The science in Antarctica and those connections are there too, but it, it's different. It's different because, because of the people. Uh, the things I've seen change a couple of things. Um, you know, we, there's, there's one road, the longest road in Greenland goes from the airport in Kangalooswak to the edge of the ice sheet. It's like 40 kilometers. Um, and that's the longest road in, in all of Greenland. You know, you can't drive from town to town, but you can go from Kangalusak to the edge of the ice, and Sher Sherry's been able to do that. And so th that's a slice of the Greenland ecosystem. We, we drive along the, the giant Watson River draining the, 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 the ice sheet. We go past ponds and lakes and smaller uh, water bodies, and, and we see the tundra, and we're gaining elevation, and it's getting cooler. And you can see that whole environment in front of you. And, having driven that road just like Lauren, time after time, day after day through time, you know, you begin to see differences. Some of the small lakes and ponds that we studied, started studying almost 10 years ago, they're gone, they've dried up. Um, I know there's this one bend where you come around, you get a, a, this amazing view of, this, of a curve in the Watson River and the, and the ice there. And I can see visibly the ice is darker. There's more debris and sediment on it, which speeds the melting. The, the, it, the ice is retre retreated, it's, it's cut back farther, and it's thinner. So, the, you know, these are visible changes in that landscape. But the other change I see is when I go to Nuuk, which is the capital of Greenland. Um, it's about the size of Hanover. Um, and uh, early on, one of the favorite places to socialize was a place called the Sky Bar, right? It was the bar on top of the, the, the one hotel, and it had a view out to the fjord, right? And that's where Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, when she visited Greenland, that's where they stayed, and she held court at the Sky Bar, and there's lots of stories about that. Um, 
But now when you go to the Sky Bar, you just see the face of the building across the street. There, there are construction cranes everywhere in Nuke, and it's just about what Sherry was talking about. It's the opening up of the ocean. It's oil and gas and mining. And um, that's the change that we're seeing now. People from outside the Arctic are coming into the Arctic. And we have a lot of work to do to settle issues around conflict. We need, we need to learn how to cooperate. And we, we need to develop a shared vision of the future of the Arctic that's fully centered around the people who live in the Arctic, which is what we've already talked about. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, and I can reiterate, I've seen some of those same changes, even having only been going to Greenland since, uh, you know, for the past nine years, a lot of the ponds that I've worked in are dry from the fact that it's getting warmer and permafrost is melting and causing a lot of water bodies, ponds to dry. It's totally changing the hydrology. And so some of that I've been able to see, which was really surprising because I didn't or wouldn't expect to be able to see that in such a short time period. The other thing I wanna add is that uh, we've had a lot of exchange students from Greenland come to Dartmouth and through conversations with them, I've also gotten to hear sort of their experiences as living in Greenland, the change that they've seen. And a lot of that centers around certain things like, well, we, it's, sometimes we don't have like a white Christmas anymore which is really unusual here. Uh, and then other things like we used to never see um, any, any tourists in our town. We used to see maybe one or two, and now we see um, you know, sometimes really large numbers of tourists in our town, and I've seen that as a change too. Um, so I think being able to hear sort of their perspectives has been really uh, exciting part of being on this community, having these students come. And I've uh, had some of these students in classes I've taught before, and they've provided a really, um, really unique perspective on rapid environmental change in the Arctic. Great. So I'm going to ask one more question, and then we're going to open it up for um, the audience to ask whatever questions you may have. And I think there's mics that are going to be going around. but. Um, I was curious if you could maybe talk a little bit about your research and how specific is your research for what's going on just in the Arctic and how much of what you're learning is relevant to other parts of the world. Okay, I can start with that. So I mentioned that uh, I study mosquitoes and um, it's, it's sort of a research project that started from my time in Greenland when I realized you know, sort of this rapid change that's going on, it's getting warmer and it's getting drier. And those are both important for mosquitoes. Um, but then also when we encountered these hunters who were hunting to um, get their three caribou that they would then freeze and have in their, um, you know, to feed their family for the year. And sort of the important role that subsistence hunting still plays in Greenland. And the fact that mosquitoes can be very bad for things like caribou. So I sort of developed this project because it was interesting from sort of the science perspective and understanding how uh, mosquitoes, which are a global pest, might respond to climate change, but then also what that might mean for uh, hunting um, in Greenland. So, um, so while we go up there, we spend a lot of time counting mosquitoes. And actually, there's a graduate student and an undergraduate there right now working on this project. Uh, we spend a lot of time kind of addressing the scientific side of it, but then we also think about, well, what are the implications? We see the mosquitoes are starting to emerge earlier, and in some years we're starting to see really um, larger numbers of mosquitoes actually emerging. Um, in particular, this year, it was a really wet and snowy year in Greenland, and so the mosquitoes, mosquito population is very high right now. And so we think about what that might mean for the caribou who, right around this time of year are giving birth to their calves and they don't really have any way of defending themselves from intense mosquito harassment. So their response is often to run around and try to find a windy ridge or um, even run out onto a glacier to avoid being harassed by mosquitoes. And that can actually have really devastating impacts on their health. So that's sort of my approach and the stuff we're doing with mosquitoes, uh, we are working to think about how what we're learning from the Arctic is relevant, of course, to mosquitoes that we see here, and then mosquitoes that also carry significant human disease in other parts of the world. So let's see, so I, I, I study soils and plants and soils and, and how climate change impacts that relationship. Um, and 
uh, Admiral Papp um, was the, essentially the U.S. Arctic ambassador during the period of the U.S. chair of the Arctic Council, which Sherry mentioned. And his, his favorite catchphrase is, what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic, okay? <laughs> and so that's, that's what I study in Greenland. So um, um, I'm very interested in, in permafrost soils, these soils that um, they thaw each year to a fairly shallow depth and they're, they're biologically active, but beneath them is this massive depth of permanently frozen soil, right? And that soil is full of organisms that are frozen in place, bacteria, fungi, and all kinds of organic matter, decaying material from plants. And um, what's happening now is as, as, as we dump more CO2 and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, the Arctic is warming, and it's warming twice as fast as the global average. And so each year, the soils thaw deeper and deeper. So that previously frozen organic matter is now, is now thawed, it's moist, and the, the bacteria and the fungi and the little soil critters that run the world now can be biologically active. So they metabolize, they decompose, and what do they do? They're releasing carbon dioxide and methane and greenhouse gases back to the atmosphere, which adds to the warming, which thaws more soil, which emits more greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. And so this is what we talk about um, as a feedback or a change that's accelerating future change. And this, these are the big surprises in the Arctic. And, and one is in the soils and greenhouse gases, and the other is what we, Sherry and I and others on the alumni tri trip witnessed, is the rapid melting of ice in the Arctic Ocean. There's a similar feedback that's driving that. So, so I'm interested in how that's happening in the Arctic, but also, What's happening in the Arctic is feeding back and is ultimately changing our climate here in Hanover. So those are the things that I study. Great, so I'm gonna now open it up for questions. There's mics that are circulating. I can't see very well. Um, so so I'm gonna, it looks like there's somebody here with their hand up and somebody there with their hand up. Um. Oh, hi. Um, my name's John Hugo, and I appreciate your reporting on the issues that you've selected. I have a question for you, however, which is, um, would you agree that if we do not solve the problem of climate change that nothing else matters, that all the money that's being spent on various other environmental uh, problems, uh, it will be subsumed by the climate change issue if we do not solve it? Uh, I guess I would agree with you that that, that is probably the the most important central global challenge is dealing with, with climate change. I, I don't know if we can separate it from all these other things that are happening or linked with it. Um, I think it, you know, in, increasing awareness and action and investment, anything we do now improves our chances of stabilizing climate and providing a more sustainable future for everyone. Um, I think what's very central about the Arctic is, is we can see it happening there now it's a harbinger for what we're gonna see in many other places ahead. And getting students to see that early in their training and their thinking, it's an opportunity, at least for some of those students, to become leaders very early um, in ways that, you know, I'm, I'm closer to the end of my career. I'm, I'm very interested now in how do we get this whole new generation that Lauren mentioned of scholars and activists um, in place to really make that difference. But you're absolutely right. Climate change is, is the primary issue, in my opinion. They need a mic. Yeah. Oh, they have one. Here it yeah, comes. Great. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm King Poor, class of '76, and uh, thank you so much for uh, all the ways you've expanded our thinking about the Arctic. Uh, I have uh, three related questions, and the first is just what is the Arctic? What are its boundaries? And um, and then actually, who owns it under international law? Um, what are the the rights or the, the ownership rights to that, those boundaries. And then the third part is, is there an international body or treaties that are in place to resolve issues um, about those ownership or use issues? Do you, do you want yeah, to start? I, I we'll tag team that yeah. one, yeah. Yeah, so how do you, that's a great question. Um, how do you define the Arctic? And when I teach this in classes here, I offer usually several different definitions and um, one of the ways we define the Arctic is simply land and ocean that's above the Arctic Circle, which is 
a place on Earth where for um, at least 24 hours a year, you either have total darkness or um, total sunlight, right? So that's 66, 66 yeah. degrees north. Um, other ways that um, we define the Arctic can often do with uh, weather patterns or um, you know, certain places where it um, never gets to, I think 10 degrees is the um, 10 degrees Celsius. Um, and uh, another definition is something like um, areas on earth uh, so far north that it's above where trees can grow. So where you're in a tundra biome. So there's a couple different ways to think about it. Um, and then um, your second question, so there are eight different countries that have land or sea territory in the Arctic, and so um, it's an international uh, you know, area that has a lot of different nation states involved. So maybe I'll turn it to Ross now to finish that. Yeah, so there, there are a number of sort of governance structures or organizations that deal with the Arctic collectively, and we, we've heard the word the Arctic Council, um, it's a high-level international fora that connects the eight Arctic nations, but it's, it's, it's the only organization of its kind that gives equal representation to six different indigenous peoples organizations that also sit at the table. And the big change now is that there's also a group of countries that can apply to be in the Arctic Council as observers. And um, um, the observers, they're, they're racing in. They're, they actually have sort of a moratorium on new members, but the observers are like China, Brazil, India, Singapore, Korea. They all have significant interests in the Arctic now over shipping, investment, oil, gas. So the Arctic has become this much bigger place than it was when I used to think about the Arctic. Um, the main agreement that, that, that we work with is un, UNCLOS, the United Nations Law to Sea Convention which regulates activities along the coastal margins of Arctic states. Um, but the, the big issue is there's a large, once you get out beyond 200 nautical miles of a coastline, you're pretty much in the high seas. And so they call it the donut hole. There's this big area of the Arctic that's, that normally is ice covered and that ice coverage is shrinking. And we don't have really clear rules about what's gonna happen in that zone. So there's a lot of attention being paid on trying to work this out. Um, uh, next week in, in, at the Wilson Center uh, for International Scholars in Washington, D.C., there's a very major conference on the U.S.-Russia Arctic relationship. Um, I've been heavily engaged in organizing that. I'll be down there. We have 600 people signed up, and these are D.C. types. These are policymakers, think tank people, lobbyists. We have 600 people coming to that meeting. Um, it'll be streamed, so if you really want to see it, go online. We have, we have an amazing lineup, but there's so much interest in potential conflict, but also potential cooperation. Um, and it's, Sherry mentioned that half the Arctic Ocean coastline is, lies in Russia. So the future of the Arctic is all about Russia, it's all about the US, it's all about Canada. Those are the, the key players in sorting this out. Great questions, thank you. There's a question in the back there, too. Uh, Andrea Corman Lowe, I'm a 77 who's lived in Britain for the last 30 years and sort of following up from this geopolitical uh, angle. Um, for US credibility, how difficult is it that the US is choosing not to be part of the Paris Agreement? And for your work specifically, you know, does this, does this affect uh, funding? Um, can the U.S. be credible in discussions under these circumstances? Great question. <laughs> Th thank you for that. No, I, I, yeah, I, will, I will answer that. It, it is the question. Um, I had the opportunity to be in Fairbanks, Alaska in, in uh, I guess it was in April, when the U.S. handed over the chairmanship to Finland. And um, going into that meeting, all the buzz was whether or not Secretary of State Tillerson would show because he is the chair of the Arctic Council during the period that U.S. was there. Um, uh, John Kerry was chairing the council up till the elections. Um, so a, a good, an important sign is Secretary Tillerson did show up. So we, he sort of validated the role of the U.S. in the Arctic Council or at least acknowledged that this organization was important. Um, 
when they went around the table, each nation, each of the Arctic Eight had three minutes to make a statement and, and, and Secret Secretary of State Tillerson was chairing that. All the other Arctic nations started with the importance of the Paris Accord um, in thinking about the future of the Arctic. Um, it was quite clear when you got to the US State Department delegation, um, uh, environment and climate were mentioned and acknowledged, but the word Paris didn't come out. Um, there was a declaration from that meeting and the U.S. signed it. The, the U.S. came in the night before all this happened and there was a lot of back and forth because the, uh, the State Department was not happy with the language uh, in that. Um, it was softened some, but Paris is in there. Um, so right now the U.S. has signed this major agreement through the Arctic Council that acknowledges the importance of the Paris Accord to stabilizing climate, which is important to the future of the Arctic. Now, whether we follow through or not, but that, that, that's kind of a little interesting thing is that that's the one place where the U.S. has actually st signed on to Paris, the new, the new administration, in a very kind of gentle way, but it is there. I have to be hopeful, um, but the devil's in the details, and we have a lot of work to do. There's a couple so, questions on this Similar side. question regarding the, uh, these agreements. My understanding is that we're not signatories to the law of the sea. So how do we function in this process as non-signatories to the only legal agreement that is supposed to regulate this whole process? Do you want to talk about it? Okay, so the, the, uh, um, that, that's correct. I mean, uh, the U.S. has not ratified the, the Law of the Sea Convention. Every president since Ronald Reagan has endorsed ratification. The, the U.S. military is, endorses ratification, but as you know, to ratify a treaty, you need is it two thirds or three quarters um, vote of the Senate. So it's blocked. It's blocked in the Senate. The official U.S. policy is to follow the law of the sea as if it is. It is U.S. policy. The the the, the, the agreement is, but we've not ratified it. Um, it places us in a difficult position with our friends and neighbors. You know, we're saying, don't worry about us. We, we, are, we understand we're gonna like abide by the general platform, but we're still not gonna sign it. So it, 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 it weakens our, our policy position around the Arctic and its future. And, uh, but I don't see any prospects of the US uh, ratifying um, the, the treaty and its current political situation. My name is Dave Cutler, class of 77. I lived for a while in New Zealand where the relative importance of Antarctica is a little bit greater than the importance of the Arctic. Right. And I was wondering if you could comment on its political status as well as its relative importance regarding climate change versus the Arctic. Um, yeah, that's a great question, thank you. And I, I, so I've, in all of my trips to the Antarctic, I've, New Zealand is the hub for the McMurdo Station in the US. Uh, Antarctic research platform. So, um, um, and so I go to New Zealand, I get on a military plane, I fly to McMurdo Station, I get off the plane, we land on the ice, they pick us up, and then we drive onto Ross Island and we pass um, Scott Base, which is the main New Zealand base, and there's a big sign there saying, welcome to the New Zealand Antarctic Territory. <laughs> All right. so, so the US base sits in the middle of the New Zealand Antarctic claim. Um, so there is a treaty, though, and it came, came about in, in 1959, um, which set aside all the international claims to land in Antarctica. It, it didn't remove them, but it set them aside to this international agreement that Antarctica would be used for peace, right, and for science. And um, that's an amazing thing, and, and perhaps because the stakes are kind of low and it's hard to get to, but we've been able to maintain that on the Antarctic continent. Um, there is a movement among the Arctic. Uh, uh, many people in the Arctic would like to see a comprehensive Arctic treaty that actually deals with the Arctic Ocean, that deals with land claims, that deals, creates a body or an agreement that helps um, create a, a more ordered future for the Arctic. Um, most of us, I, I, I love that idea. I, I don't, there's too many sovereign nations with, with distinct geopolitical and economic interests to imagine how that could happen. But the Antarctic example is informative 
of the, of the important role of, of particularly of science and science diplomacy to keep nations talking to one another. Climate is affecting Antarctica. I see the same changes in the dry valleys that I see in the Arctic. I see, I see thaw, I see melt, I see more water. We see more tourists. Um, um, all these things are happening um, at a different pace and a different scale, but they're happening in the Antarctic as well. Hi, Kayla Gabeck, class of 2012. How are you doing? Um, I look forward to seeing you next week. I'll be one of those uh, policy people in yes, D.C. Yes, you will. <laughs> um, I have the privilege of working with indigenous communities in the U.S. Arctic. Um, we're working on a lot of the issues that you mentioned in the introduction, national security, um, energy, and natural resource development, um, improving the health and well-being of the community living there and their access to other communities. Um, to get there, you can only fly in, so they have a lot of missing infrastructure that will be critical as things open up. Um, what role, if any, is Dartmouth currently playing in the U.S. Arctic? I'm hearing a lot about your great research mm -hmm. abroad, but what are we doing here at home? Right. Well, I think one of the major things that we're doing is, is in the engagement in, in Arctic policy issues that are central to the state of Alaska, but also how those connect to the international um, interests. Um, as a co-lead scholar for the Fulbright program, um, we have a number of, of U.S. scholars and a number of scholars from Alaska that were part of our program. And we were focused there on um, health and well-being in the U.S. Arctic. Um, and also uh, issues that keep coming up more and more around infra infrastructure. Um, it's very difficult to communicate in, in, in the Arctic. Uh, we don't have uh, access to the web, um, other kinds of uh, Communication platforms are, are not as developed as they should be. Ports, roads, all of these things um, are, are really important resources that Alaska is, is definitely lacking. Um, so your, your, your wonderful uh, Alaska Senator Murkowski, Lisa Murkowski, often lectures about the two Arctics, right? And she talks about the sort of the Scandinavian, the developed Arctic. She talks about the developed Arctic. She doesn't include Alaska in that description. It's because of, of the major lack of investment in, in, in health, well-being, infrastructure, um, education. There's so many things that we should be doing better um, for the people of, of, of Alaska and for indigenous peoples and, and native communities throughout the U.S. They're not isolated to Alaska. Um, but that's an important thing that we try to bring to Dartmouth, to Dartmouth students, that all of these issues are connected. Um, but uh, I, 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 and I, I enjoy seeing you in Washington next week to talk more about this. Yeah, thanks, Caleb. Okay, so I'd like to mention another side to uh, Dartmouth Polar Research um, that was started, I think, back in the 30s by Millette Morgan in the engineering school, which became the radio physics department and has transmuted out into space physics in the physics department and uh, engineering school. Uh, where we do uh, uh, research into the ionosphere and the uh, aurora mm -hmm. and launch uh, rockets from Alaska, Norway, various places like that, various ground-based research, which is what has gotten me to uh, Greenland and Antarctica. Um, and uh, I believe that Millette Morgan actually was instrumental in bringing Krell, the Cold Regions Research and Engineering Laboratory, to Hanover. Uh, it was originally going to be sited in Colorado by the Army Corps of Engineers, and I think he was part of uh, convincing them to bring it here. No, that, that's right. That's a very important part of our history, and I, it, it's, it is important also to acknowledge um, uh, the Thayer School of Engineering in particular um, in their long history working with Krell. Um, on the development of ice core drilling science. This is a relatively new field, but it's, it's the ice core is the two-mile time machine that Richard Alley calls it, that have allowed us to understand change in, in climate history, but also the fingerprint of humans on climate and climate history. Um, uh, in addition to having the Institute of Arctic Studies here, uh, Mary Albert heads the U.S. ice core drilling program office. So all of the ice core drilling in the Arctic and the Antarctic are actually coordinated from, Han from Dartmouth and through that Thayer School of Engineering. So that between Arctic Studies, Thayer, Krell, um, all the, the atmospheric research going on at physics, 
We have uh, studio artists in the field with us this year. We have uh, uh, Mary Flanagan at Tilt Factor doing uh, climate change games for change that focus on Arctic. You know, our fingerprints are everywhere on this campus and it's just amazing to see um, how productive these relationships are. So I'm Jack Cushman, 76. Um, thank you for this presentation. As a journalist, I'm really envious of your ability to go into the field and do field research and to observe things that no human has ever observed before, even though they're going to be the new normal. Um, but I'm dissatisfied with the level of engagement by scientists in the policy space. This, there seems to remain some reluctance to bring science um, directly and forcefully into the policy space. I'd like to hear more about what you're doing with your science students to be sure that they're engaged in policy making in this area in the future. Lauren, do you want yeah, to talk? Absolutely, yeah. So I know that part of my training as a student here, as a graduate student, was having those conversations about policy and being introduced to what is policy and what is the role of science and scientists in the policy conversation. And I know that people become scientists for all different reasons and want to have that scientific training for you know, whatever their eventual career interest is, whether that's you know, continuing to be a scientist or um, being a scientist who starts to work in the fields of policy or science communication or outreach. And I know that in my cohort of seven students, uh, I think at least two of them, after finishing their PhDs, went directly into policy positions as um, uh, congressional science fellows in Washington. And so they are uh, drawing on the training they received at Dartmouth, and I think largely because of the training that they received here as graduate students, they were able to go into those positions and be quite successful. So I think a lot of those conversations that we have, uh, even starting at the undergraduate level and through the graduate level, are really inspirational for a lot of Dartmouth students to kind of think about um, or to be more prepared to engage with that. Yeah, an example of what we're doing uh, next week, all of next week, the Dickey Center Arctic Studies is hosting a, a week-long uh, workshop, if you will, um, on science diplomacy, and then connected with that as a model Arctic Council event, and it's focused on U.S. and Canada. We have 18 high school students from around, from the U.S. and Canada coming here to have a two-day workshop on the connection between science and diplomacy, and then they're, they're being assigned to uh, be delegates from the U.S. and Canada to run a, a mock Arctic Council a meeting and to develop a declaration around a set of issues that, that are important to the U.S.-Canada relationship. So th those, the, we're, we're really interested in how to reach into early career, high school into the first couple of years of college in particular, to give students an opportunity to see that, that whatever major they have, it's relevant to policy and politics and, and the communication skills are central to all of that. And, and I think as a journalist, you know very well that, that that's, that's the, where science falls down is being able to engage directly in that kind of conversation. We have time for two more questions. Yeah, I'm Catherine Cates, I'm a 78. Um, it, I, you mentioned about the, f the melting of the uh, permafrost and it going down and, and talked about the history. Is it, you know, I think I read somewhere that you know, there might be old diseases or you know, mutant DNA or whatever. I mean, you were worried about the CO2 right. generation from right. the melting, but you know, is there any danger that ancient plagues will reappear with the melt? <laughs> Uh, well, th there was a really interesting report uh, out a number of months ago about um, uh, animals contracting anthrax um, from spores that have previously been frozen in soils in Siberia. Um, if you visit some of the historic huts in Antarctica on Ross Island, there's, a war there's warnings there that there are anthrax spores which have survived from, from the, the hay and feed brought down for Robert Falcon Scott's ponies. So um, there are all kinds of uh, secrets, if you will, hidden in these uh, frozen soils. Um, I don't think anyone sees that, that you know, a global plague is, is, is hidden there, 
But, but it goes to show you that, that you know, uh, we have lasting imprints on the environment um, and that rapid change in the environment creates uncertainty. And um, we, we probably need to be a little better prepared and, and move our science forward more quickly to anticipate or at least understand when these things happen, how to respond. Hi, Arthur Howe, the class of 76, and a proud geography major. Um, I too have had the good fortune to have been in a, uh, a Kala Weather Frobisher Bay formerly um, years ago. But given the enormous international security ramifications um, for the changes going on in the Arctic, um, is there any cooperation or what's the interest uh, on behalf of the military industrial complex um, in terms of research in the Arctic? And, how are they? How are they, or how are you collaborating with them in that regard? Well, I, I would say the as a scientist, actually, the area where, like, for example, the U.S. and Russia, where we have good working relationships, it is through science. The the U.S. and Russia have been working very productively in the Arctic Council on environmental assessments, on search and rescue strategies, um, on oil spill prevention and preparedness. Um, and uh, we, Russia and the U.S. and the rest of the Arctic just signed a binding agreement on scientific cooperation, which is meant to make it easier for scientists to move across borders, to move our equipment, um, just get along better and more productively. So um, um, I, I, I'm a bit of a, a, an optimist in, in this regard. I think that, that science and, and the Arctic remain an area where U.S. and Russia have a history of cooperating. And we still are. It's the one area where we actually kind of are meeting regularly and, and doing good work. Um, the fear that we all have, uh, those that work in the Arctic, is that the rest of the geopolitical world intrudes on a long history of collaboration and cooperation in the Arctic. And we're doing everything we can to prevent that. This meeting that I'm engaged with at the Wilson Center um, on the U.S.-Arctic relationship um, much of that meeting is about pointing to examples where we are productively engaged and, and what are the lessons from that. But it, it's a very delicate balance and um, um, I, I can't predict w where it's headed, but a lot of people are concerned and working very hard to try to sustain uh, this cooperative uh, um, set of activities that we're, we find ourselves engaged in right now. So I think we're going to need to wrap it up because we're out of time. Um, but I hope you all got as much out of this as I got out of it. Um, I, you know, one of the things I learned on this trip also was that I was a lot like most Americans because our border is so little on Arctic. Most Americans are not spending time thinking about these issues. But um, like you, you're curious enough to be here to learn about the Arctic. And I hope all of you will tell your classmates what you've learned about what we're doing in the Arctic and Dartmouth's role. And I would encourage any of you that are interested in having more conversation with, with um, Ross, not only to come up after here and ask questions, but go on the trip. It's really, really interesting. All right. <laughs>